Hey everybody, Tom Pierce here again, AKA the Scale Nerd. Welcome back to my Overwatch video series where we're looking at the build of a Polaris uh, Quadra bike with a Navy SEAL sniper team. It's a kit from UFAN Models out of Asia. Uh, the uh, the Quadra bike is one kit, and then I also bought the two figures. There are different figures you can get to go with that bike, but I bought the two figures that were the Navy SEAL sniper team, a uh, spotter and a sniper. So in our first video, we did the build of the Quadra bike. Second video, we painted it. Third video, we did all the weathering and distressing and finishing up of the Quadra bike. Now this video, video number four, we're gonna be taking a look at the figures themselves, the two figures from UFAN. Uh, we'll do the assembly, uh, priming, painting, all the way through to finish, uh, finished product, get them mounted on the bike. And then the last video that will be coming up will be the little vignette. Uh, we'll put them in a scene, some sort of Afghanistan scene. So it'll be a little vignette diorama type scene. So don't want to hold you up any longer. It's going to be a little bit longer video. So let's get started right away. Okay, so here you see now we have our two figures for our Overwatch scene. Uh, the Navy SEAL sniper here with his rifle, and then we have his spotter. So uh, you'll see that I've already started some of the assembly. Uh, when they come, uh, obviously you typically have to put uh, assemble the bodies together, put the arms on, put the legs on, the head on, and so on and so forth. Uh, my general rule of thumb is that I get all of the limbs on uh, because you end up normally having some sort of a seam that you're going to have to deal with here. So if you look at uh, look at these, you've got seams at the arms. No matter how good the fit, you're going to have some level of a seam that you're going to have to clean up and hide. So um, try to get those on first before I do any priming and painting or anything. Uh, in terms of the weapons and the head i generally wait till the end to get those done so the reason behind that being uh when we do the head it's a lot easier for me to to do the painting of the face before the head is glued on because as you can see in the case of the sniper right here you know a lot of his face is covered up by the rifle and the rifle scope uh, sometimes it's hard to get down in and around their neck and their chin and so forth once their head is on. So I usually wait till the end to go ahead and glue the head on. So you say, well, why are their heads on now? Well, in this specific case, I'm dealing with two figures that each have an optical um, device uh, included in their uh, story here. So the spotter has got a spotting scope and the obviously the sniper has the rifle scope. These have to line up to their heads or to their eyes, more importantly, pretty closely. So when I glued the arms on, I, um, I really couldn't know exactly how to position the arms and get them glued on exactly correctly so that once I glued the heads on, that the scopes would line up properly with their, with their face or with their eyes. So and by um, going on ahead and just kind of temporarily tack gluing the heads on, I'm able to go ahead and do a better job of gluing the arms on accurately. And in this case, since they're holding the scopes and the rifles, I actually had to go ahead and do something I normally wouldn't do, and that's to glue the scope and the rifle to their hands so that I knew exactly how all this is going to come together and end up having everything line up. I don't like doing it that way, but you really, I really didn't have much of a choice in this situation. So now that I've got the arms and the scopes and the weapons all lined up properly and glued in, I can actually go ahead and remove the heads. So hopefully they'll just pop right out of here. Just wiggle that around a little bit. And that head will come right off. So now I can go ahead and proceed with the rest of the assembly and the painting uh, without things kind of being in the way. Now with the rifle uh, and the sniper, the issue I ran into is no matter how I positioned the arm and the rifle, I never could really get the scope to line up perfectly with his, uh, with his eyes. So one of two things are going to have to happen here. Either he's just you know taking his uh, eye out of the scope momentarily to look down range and see what he's trying to scope in on, or I'm going to have to decide to go ahead and do some modification to his head 
more importantly his neck to try to get his head to lean over to the side a little bit more and line up with the scope. Okay, so my next step is to go ahead and start doing the cleanup uh, and uh, um, kind of blending of the limbs where they come in. So in the case of this sniper here with his legs, you can see that while one of his legs, the actual joint where the leg went on takes place at the edge of a strap that goes around his leg. So that works out really well because that creates a natural scene that I don't have to worry about hiding or covering up or blending in. However, the other leg uh, is just on a, across the, you know, his, his back of his leg and his rear end there. So it's just a uniform area um, that's not a natural seam. So we're going to have to try to blend and hide this little seam we got there. So we'll take a look here and see what that's going to involve. I like to use these little sanding sticks, a uh, combination of a lot of different techniques that we can use to uh, ultimately get rid of those. Uh, seams, but I usually start out with the sanding stick and go in and just start trying to smooth that out. Now, another issue we have to look for is going to be mold seams. So I don't know if you can see this, but uh, right here along his side, there's a little bit of a seam there from the two piece mold. So we're going to have to go in there and kind of clean up those seams uh, again we can use a sanding stick or an exacto knife and just kind of go in and kind of shave and feather that away to try to get rid of these molding seams on these ufan models they actually weren't very bad at all so i didn't have to spend a lot of time on it but it does is something that you want to go ahead and take care of because once you start painting you don't want to go through and find a bunch of seams that uh, you know kind of ruin the look of the of the model. So we definitely got some issues on the arms we're going to have to take care of here. So I've got uh, this arm cleaned up, the legs cleaned up. I do a little bit of work here on his uh, on his straps around his waist there to clean out these grooves a little bit. Not worried about him on this side because he's got some gear that's going to glue on there and cover that area up. But like I said, I still got some work here to do on this shoulder because in order to get the arm to bend over far enough to move the rifle over, uh, I actually had to leave a little bit of a gap back there. To be honest, actually, I had to heat up his arm a little bit. And that's one of the things about working with a resin figure like this instead of plastic figures. Plastic figures, um, you can, uh, there's a few things that you can do in terms of using like uh, thin cement to melt, uh, to melt some of these seams together. Uh, that with resin you can't so you're going to have to use other means but one of the benefits of the resin is you can actually heat it like over a candle or with a heat gun uh, any way you can apply some heat to it without you know getting too hot and and deforming it uh, unnecessarily uh, once you get it warmed up a little bit you can bend these figures so i was able to bend his arm in and bend his shoulder up a little bit uh, and then once it cools it locks in at that shape but regardless of all that work I did to it, I still ended up with somewhat of a gap here. So what I'm gonna do is go in and take uh, some putty and fill that gap in there and try to clean that up a little bit. So what I normally use, what I normally use for this uh, cleanup process is this Tamiya basic putty. They have a couple different types. This is the one I prefer to use for that. So it's just a little gray putty that I'll take my X-Acto knife and just kind of fish out a little blob of that there and then come over in here to his shoulder find the part that needs the work and kind of feed that down into the gap so you can see he had a bad seam right here along his leg so i've gone on ahead and you know shoved the putty down in there and it's kind of a messy proposition at best until that putty dries it's kind of nasty looking once it dries i've got to go back in and sand it and and knife it a little bit to clean that up and get some of the original contours and and mold sculpt back to where it was originally because that putty just kind of covers everything up and dirties everything up, but there, I don't know of any other way of dealing with it. 
on the resin figures. So we'll let that dry and I'll go in and clean that up. Uh, kind of the same thing here, looking at the shoulder. So we've got some issues here, gone in and applied the putty. Uh, once again, a little bit too much because it's just the only way I can get the gap to fill up. And once that gap's filled up, I'm gonna have to go in and clean that shoulder up and get some of the wrinkles back in his shirt and uh, you know, really try to get the mold restored back to its original sculpt shape uh, without the gaps. So here's another little trick that I do, I think a lot of modelers do for working on figures, is I just kind of temporarily tack glued the sniper to this little block of wood, give him a little seat to sit on there. So as I'm working on <clears throat> the figure, I don't have to actually handle the figure and risk breaking something off that I've glued on or, or getting my hands or fingers on the paint anywhere. So for the spotter, I'm gonna do something a little similar, but a little different. Basically take that a block of wood and drive a little finish nail into it. And then uh, we'll go actually right up into the bottom of the figure, kind of drill a hole, not too deep, but and you're going to mount that right up into that finished nail. So what we'll do, uh, because of the head of that nail on there, we'll clip that off. So take some side cuts here and just clip that off of there. And hopefully it'll fit. Okay, so now I got my figures ready to work on. I'm gonna go through each uh, each kit of the two kits and take all the other little small pieces and we'll start cutting them off of the sprue and trimming off the spruce stems, cleaning up any seams, and uh, get those ready to go. So, Okay, so even with uh, actually a pretty impressive level of detail and gear molded into each of these figures, um, you can see they've got quite a bit of gear and detail molded in. Even so, there's still a significant amount of gear you can see here, additional gear that has to go on them yet. Now, <clears throat> sometimes I like to paint items like this separately from the figures, um, just because it makes it a little bit easier to you know, fully paint all the, in detail all the way around each individual item. Uh, and it also, you know, once you put this stuff on here, it can get really difficult to try to get in between some of these items to paint the uniform, uh, especially when you're dealing with this camouflage pattern uh, to try to get in there and, and, and create that camouflage pattern once you've got all this noise glued on there. So I've got to evaluate this now and determine exactly what items I want to go ahead and glue on uh, and, and what I'm going to wait and paint in separately and uh, glue on later. So, so I normally use uh, this Gorilla Glue Super Glue Gel to work with my resin figures. It seems to work really good on resin parts. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the backpacks on. I have decided that um, I want to get those on before the paint.
Okay, so obviously I went ahead and decided to pretty much glue all the gear on. I'm not exactly sure why I did that this time, but that's that's where I went with it. So we'll just go ahead uh, and get this in primer and see how it's looking and uh, take it from there. The only things that I have left to glue on obviously are going to be their heads. And then this gun, I've decided that I'm not going to actually mount it on the spotter. It's a spotter's, um, st spotter's rifle, so I'm actually going to have it off of him and, and laying on the rack of the uh, Polaris bike. Okay, so to work on the heads, uh, I did the same little trick here with uh, mounting, drilling a hole in the neck of the head of the of one of the characters, the, the spotter, and run that little nail up into it and mount it down in the paint uh, block of wood. Allows me to go ahead and paint that thing easily. And then what I've got going on here with the sniper is I just took some uh, milliput and made a little blob of milliput there. And because of the way this guy's neck, let's see if I can show you there, his neck has a little post that fits down into fits down into the neck there. I, I didn't want to drill that out and screw that up, so uh, I just took that that shape there and shoved it down into some milliput. Okay, so we'll shoot the primer now. I use the Iwata Eclipse. HPCS airbrush running about 23 to 25 pounds of air pressure out of the Campbell Housefield uh, large compressor. We're going to be shooting um, the Tamiya liquid surface primer. It's an, em an enamel based primer, and we're mixing that 50 uh, 50 or one to one with some enamel thinner. So let's get started. So here they are, all primered up and ready to go. Detail is just amazing. Fantastic, really excited about these. There's my two heads. Okay, so we'll get started uh, painting the bodies on these two figures. We'll save the heads for later. So got the spotter and the sniper here. I'm going to start out with uh, some Vallejo uh, acrylic Iraqi sand as a base color. So the vast majority of these characters uniforms are going to be that sand color. Um, so we're going to start this might not be exactly the color that I want, but it's okay because I'm going to be doing so much filtering and shading and, and camouflage work and so forth on there that I want to tweak it as I go along. But for to get started, I want to get a good solid base of this Iraqi sand color uh, underneath there. So we'll let it up an airbrush and get it shot. Okay, while I found that uh, in my research that these Navy SEALs, they typically could wear any one of a number of different camouflage patterns or, or even not even camouflage in many cases. So, uh, and they didn't all guys in the same squad necessarily wear the same uh, camo pattern. And I even found a lot of cases where they were mix and match. So they might have, you know, different uniforms and, and depending on what's clean or what's available or what's tore up. Um, sometimes they would be mixing and matching different camo patterns together. So I thought I'd do something like that on this sniper to make him a little bit more uh, unique and different. I'm going to use the digital 
um, desert camo pattern on the majority of these figures, but uh, on this sniper, I'm gonna throw some, uh, some other camo patterns in here just to add a little bit of unique interest to the figure and kind of reflect what typically ends up happening sometimes in the field.
So next up, I'm gonna start using some artist oils here. I find that using those really helps me to do blending of large shadow to light areas like those shown in the uniforms of figures like this. Also helps them with the flesh tones to get smooth blends. Uh, it works really great. Takes a long time to dry, but it's, it's worth, I think, in the long run. Uh, it has a little, gets a little bit shiny, so I'll show you how I deal with that. But if I got uh, large camo patterns like this one, I can still use the oils to do the shading because the different colors are such large patches. But really small camo areas, it's not so easy. Uh, so at any rate, this is a, something I use called Liquin. It will make that oil dry faster. Otherwise, it can take a week or longer to dry, uh, which I don't have the patience for that. It does make it a little bit shinier, which is another downside of it. But I mix it about 50-50 with the oil paint. And what that does is that gives me about a 24-hour dry time. Uh, so I did all the camo because of the tight little camo pattern in this digital camo. I did it all with the acrylics. Uh, just because I can't do large blended shading in areas like that. But on the on the colors like the the gear on the side and the lower parts of his shirt, the solid color, I was able to go and use the oils. Uh, so I just kind of put a base color down over top of the acrylic to give me something to start with. And then I go in with darker colors to in my shadow areas and lighter colors in the highlight areas and then just start blending them all together. And, and the oils just really blend together really really well and i don't run into the problem with the paint drying in my brush so quickly like i do with acrylics it's one of the things that drives me crazy about doing detail work with acrylics is when i have a small brush and not a lot of paint loaded sometimes it dries in the brush before i can get the work done on the figure um kind of frustrating i'm not quite sure how some of the guys are overcoming that challenge but at any rate with uh, the oils i don't have that issue however you got to be careful it's wet for a while and uh, it'll, you'll rub it off with your hands so you got to take care as you do it and, and be careful but it really you can move it around and blend it at just about any time uh within 24 hours uh with that liquid in there and it'll it'll dry up pretty good overnight um, then after that i just over shoot the whole uh, figure with a clear coat of uh, of a matte finish and that just kind of seals everything in but it also knocks that sheen down and, and gets it back down to more of a matte finish and then I can go back over top of that with uh, hand brushing in satins and glosses for specific different uh, elements of gear you know that might be metal or glass or something like that and I need them to stay shiny so when I airbrush the matte finish uh i can bring it back to gloss uh in isolated areas with by hand painting so i'll go ahead and finish up here with the uh, blending of the uh oils in on the faces uh, the heads the gear and we'll start wrapping this paint job up
Okay, so now I'm going to use some pigments, some dry pigments to go in and dirty up uh, the feet and the lower pant legs uh, up. So a couple different techniques I'm doing here, some washes and some dry uh, uh, pigment fixing and so forth to try to let that get nice and dirty and sandy looking. So that done, a little bit of glue on the heads or the necks so I can drop the heads in place and get that all set up. I get all my um, my matte finish sprayed on there and heads uh, affixed. So just about ready to take these things off and get them mounted. So I decided to go ahead and uh, mount this gun on the stowage deck or stowage rack of the bike. So I'm going to go ahead and paint this now. This is a little trick I do. I just wrap some masking tape around my finger and then I can uh, tape the gun down to my finger and then I don't have to try to hold it and uh, it makes it real easy to paint the gun, especially in situations where I'm only going to paint one side of it because it's going to be laying down on the rack. And then once I get it all painted up uh, with the acrylics. Uh, go ahead and take some uh, panel line detailer uh, and drop that in there to try to bring out some of the shadows and details uh, and let that dry and then go back in with the acrylic again and brighten up my highlights and try to just really bring it together. Uh, sorry for the focus of the camera. It's kind of hard to get that thing to really show up well. And then once I get all of that done, uh, just a little bit of dry brushing to try to... Uh, bring the last bit of detail forward and then I take this graphite pencil or graphite stick I should say and rub over all the high surface areas and that gives it that nice metallic sheen and uh, just really kind of brings it to life. Go ahead and glue it down to the rack and we're good to go. Okay guys, there you go. That's the figures. So we got the bike built and painted weather. We got the figures built and painted and mounted. So the project's pretty much at a point now where all we have left is the base. We need to put it in and bring it to life and put it in a scene. So our next and final video in this Overwatch series will be the little vignette diorama of them set up somewhere up in the mountains of Afghanistan, ready to fire. So I'll try to put together a nice video for you to show you the process that I go through to create the terrain and, and uh, the base and the terrain. So in the meantime, continue to come back and check me out on Facebook, the Scale Nerd page. Um, got a lot of good content, content on there. I hope that you can find helpful as well as YouTube, my channel. Check through my videos as I continue to grow the library. You're gonna find four now on the Overwatch series and uh, soon to be five. And I just hope to keep growing it. So. Uh, come back again. Thanks for taking the time to watch and I hope that you enjoyed this video. Take care and safe and happy modeling guys.